Christmas stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite and greatest son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And what a great treat we have today. He's won a ton of titles. He was a mainstay in the Crockett territory. Former NWA Georgia junior heavyweight champion. He is now a trainer, and he is wearing a very colorful jacket that he's going to tell yes. us about because I just heard yeah. about it. And it's awesome. It is Mr. George South. George, welcome Thank to the show. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, uh, John, you and Jerry, thank you. I've been so excited all day. I've drunk like 15 Mountain Dews. Uh, <laughs> so, so, buddy, we're we're wired. Uh, we're all ready. right, all right, George. Just speaking of wired, man, you you got you got you got something that you're wearing there that's very near and dear to your heart, a signature. Uh, you're wearing a jacket that I, I recognize when, when I came on with you uh, the, in a pre-show conversation here. But tell us a little bit about that jacket and, and, and how you acquired it and the, the man behind it. Well, you know what is so special to me to still be living here in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, you know, the, the, the home of, of course, Jim Crockett Promotions and the old NWA. And of course, uh, you spent so much time here, uh, Jerry, you know, at the old Park Center which I'm only five minutes from, if you can believe it. And uh, I love that building. That's where, uh, as a very young man, I would go every Monday night, uh, you know, to see uh, my heroes. And uh, I became good friends with Ole and Gene Anderson, if you can believe it. And uh, you're, you're, you're Ole's only friend. Huh? Man, I guarantee you that. Uh, you're the one. <laughs> I'm the only one. Uh, John, you know, one time Ole invited me to his house, if you can believe it, in Georgia. No. And I went. And listen, he would not let me in the house till I took my shoes off. And I'm thinking it was a rib. And he said, no. He said, I want you to take your shoes and your socks off. You're not walking <laughs> in my house. So I did in the middle of winter. I took my shoes off to come in his house. But, you know, I don't so, think I want guys walking around barefoot on my carpet. Man, you, I mean, leave, leave your socks yeah. on. I don't get the yeah. socks. I can see the shoes, but I don't get the socks. Buddy, John, I took them both off. Like, what am I going to tell you standing on the So it's freezing court. cold out there, and you got to take freezing. your shoes and socks off. Freezing. And we got in, and it was a immaculate house. But he, it, I said, okay. I was afraid to sit down. I was afraid to sit down. <laughs> But you know, I've become good. No, no, and only he still had the plastic on the on the <laughs> of, of the couch. <laughs> well, I actually had to stand outside while he yeah. talked. So, but, but you know, I've become good friends with Gene. You know, Gene, yeah. uh, his later years, he became an agent there, even with WCW, and just became uh, good friends. We would make trips together, and of course, he passed away. You know, he was a uh, deputy sheriff, Jerry, right. here in Charlotte when he passed. And uh, you know what was so amazing is years later, I found out that the prisoners, when Gene died, the prisoners here in Charlotte, they took up money. They took up an offering to send flowers to Gene, to his family. And they, I remember the jail told me that they had never done that for anybody. That's how much Gene was liked, you know, uh, by the prisoners where he worked. But but his, he had passed away and his family was doing some cleaning and his sweet wife called and said, you know, I've got a bag of stuff that belonged to Gene. Uh, would you, would you want it? And of course I said, yes. Oh gosh. I headed over and, and just big old bag of stuff, got home and started going through it. Uh, John, and believe it or not, this, this sports coat, uh, and I'm just going to try to stand up. I wish the people could see inside the name, Jerry, it says Gene Anderson, uh, I could make it out because I recognize that signature. Oh, my goodness. And so this jacket is actually uh, one of Gene Anderson's. And, and of course, uh, the, the newer fans may remember that towards the end of his career, he managed Jimmy Snuka and Ray Stevens and had a great career as a manager. But he always wore uh, wore this jacket out. Uh, was smoking a big old cigar. So you know, you know, George, that was, that was the thing about the hills back in the South, back in those days. I can imagine they were. The Hills, you, you, they always dressed up. I mean, they yeah. always, they, and, and Jim Crockett, he, you know, he ran a tight ship as we were discussing before. Jim Crockett ran such a, Jim Crockett Sr. ran such a tight ship there. You know, he had, we were all talking. He had all the baby faces, the good guys, an hour before the doors, uh, 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 the doors were open, sat inside the Park Charlotte Park Center, which you're, you're a neighbor of now, right. and signed sign autographs. We couldn't sell pictures. We couldn't sell anything. Everything was free. If they had a ticket, you signed for them. 
And you wow. sit there until everybody in the, got in the building got seated. You sit there. Mr. Crockett kept an evil eye on you. Make sure you did, <laughs> did it with your oh. college class. But that, that's just how those old territories ran back then. I mean, you're right. a product of that. What you know, you grew up there in Charlotte. Tell us what what it t- what, what what was your what was your spark that said, "Hey, man, I love this sport." I'm going. Hey, I'm hey, going. George. Before you do, let yeah. me ask you one quick question. Before, okay, so I don't have to go back. The, okay. the signature of Gene Anderson in your jacket is that his signature? Yeah, yes, exactly. His wife. His wife said. Uh, it's was, one of those embroidery things, you know, John, where you, you, yeah, you, you, so, you, yeah. you sign your signature. Uh, yeah, so the tailor, the tailor took his signature. Right, right. You would yeah. sign it on just an old notebook sheet of paper, and then you would send it in as you had the jacket made, and the, the, the tailor would take your signature, almost like a tattoo. I mean, honestly, they would take yeah. your signature, and then they would go over <laughs> his signature inside the jacket. That's cool. So, and now we, we we were ribbing each other before we started to hear about the jacket. You know why why did they put your signature? I mean, how many jackets of that of that color is going to be on that uh, when you go <laughs> into a locker room? But you know they had they had a tailor there for a minute, Jim Crockett Senior, first personal tailor. He would yeah. come and he'd take the guy's measurements and and he would come to make you a jacket. And I used to kid her because everybody would get the same same plag cover. <laughs> and guy, would, guy would just buy buy what do they call those damn bundles of, of material, and then make everybody make a jacket until all the material ran out. Then then the new style jacket would come in. But, so but it's like a uniform. It was right. like a uniform. It was, the heels would all look, walk around looking the same. I guess so. You couldn't. <laughs> oh, I love that. But you're right, Jerry. They all were so sharply dressed. Uh, back then, I mean, you know, I I've got old programs from from Jim Crockett Promotions from the fifties and the sixties, and and wow. just to see the guys that came in, uh, you know, were all dressed up, and and I love that part of it, man. It was just such a special uh, special time, uh, and, and you know, my story is just a little bit different, Jerry. You know, I lost uh, my mom and dad when I was a, a very young man, six years old. Mom and dad. Uh, they both got killed in a car wreck. And uh, what happened with me is is uh, I bounced around. Like I had some brothers that would try to, you know, to bring me in and, and give me a place to stay. And I was just a disrespectful brat. And uh, and I stayed with uh, my last brother, Brother Bill. He was my hope. And I remember one day I just turned on the television uh, at 10 years old and I saw uh, Wahoo McDaniels. Uh, on television and that's the first time I'd ever seen pro wrestling and man I was hooked and then of course I found out even you know a few days later you could go see it at the matches you could go live uh, Monday night and again which nowadays is unheard of but it was every Monday night that Jim Crockett Promotions ran uh, here in Charlotte and and uh, we were speaking of a ticket you know I remember they used to I remember when I had my first ticket to the wrestling matches. I, I I slept with it, Jerry. John, I slept with it for three weeks. And you used to go into the park center and they would be an old lady at the old turn uh, turntable thing that she would tear your ticket. Well, I walked in after, you know, this ticket was like gold to me and she wanted it. And and I remember now, Jerry, I wouldn't give it to her, John. She, she said, well, I'm gonna tear it in two and give it back. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, you're not. So, but I've got I got in live, and I'll never forget to see Paul Jones. Uh, who now, Jerry? I'll talk a lot about him today. He was my favorite. I mean, oh, he was one of my uh, brothers, man. So you talk man, all you want to about. Paul. Let me tell you something, Jerry. Right before Paul passed, uh, he was living in Charlotte, and I would always take him. I'd go once a week to take him out to eat, and I walked in, and he was on the phone one night. So I walk in, and he said, "Here, this is for you." So Johnny hands me the phone, and it was your brother, Jack Briscoe. Yeah. And I sat down, and me and Jack talked for like 40 minutes, and I, I can still hear Paul cussing me <laughs> because he was ready to go eat. Yeah. But no, man, I, I grabbed that phone, and what a thrill for me, even being in the wrestling business, to be able to talk with Jack. He just handed me the phone. They were just talking like, you know, like me and you're talking. And, uh, man, just special times. So... <laughs> But, you know, I turned the television on. And, of course, back then there was no wrestling schools. Uh, you know, and as you know, uh, uh, Jerry, the, the business was so hard. People get tired of me saying that. But, 
it was very hard to get into business. Uh, I remember as a young man, I asked uh, uh, Jimmy Crockett one time, I said, where, where do the wrestlers get their boots? And I remember he cussed <laughs> me out. Like he cussed me out at the matches because just, what, just wanted to, and you were a ticket buyer and he still cussed you out. I was a <laughs> ticket buyer. I said, well, where the wrestlers got their boots. Cause it was on, you didn't know any of that. Yeah, and, no. uh, Everything there was, no was kayfabe. <laughs> yeah, big kayfabe. And there was no, uh, of course, no wrestling schools. Uh, there was just no way to get in uh, professional wrestling. And, and uh, you know, 17 uh, years old, I started working in an old cotton mill warehouse, if you can believe it. You're working in that warehouse. and But I still had that dream uh, to be a pro wrestler. And it just one day I opened up an old newspaper, and it was a little ad uh, John, that just said, you want to be a wrestler? And I said, holy cow. I mean, you kidding? Yeah. And and so I answered that ad, and, and it was an old run-down building outside of Charlotte. And uh, I remember knocking on the door. The, the the door about fell off the hinges. It was so old and run-down, and they had a ring set up. And here's how dumb I was. They There was an old-timer named Rusty Roberts that worked a little bit in Memphis. It was him and a Samoan. Uh, in the ring, and and I interrupted them, and and they said, "What do you want?" And I said, "Well, I want to be a wrestler." And here's where that changed my life. They said, "Well, okay, come on." And I thought, "Man, wow, this is pretty easy." That's all and I got to do. <laughs> the minute I stepped in that ring for the next two hours, they they have killed me. <laughs> I, I mean, John, they beat me. They knocked a tooth out. They broke my nose. They ripped my clothes. <laughs> Because, you know, the, the way it was then is you you ain't coming in our business. No. Um, and because and, they looked at it, well, you're not taking my spot. And here I am, you know, just getting ready to turn 18 years old and cocky and thought I had. There ain't nothing to this. How how big were you at that time, George? Man, I was a very small guy. I, I mean, I was, Lord, I was good to do maybe 150 pounds, but I was going to change the world. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what was so special is the only wrestling I was getting was Channel 3 here in Charlotte, uh, watching Mid-Atlantic Wrestling. And, and, of course, my wrestling magazines. Uh, Big Bill Ward. Big Bill Ward. My goodness. And, of course, Bob Cottle. You remember him? Uh, oh, of Jerry, course, yeah. Uh, just as special people. And I can remember as a young man, I would go to the matches. And, and, and if you can imagine this, guys, the wrestlers used to come out and watch the other matches and and so as a young man i remember i would go up to paul jones with all of these questions and, and listen <laughs> this year so every time paul would send me to get him some coffee and every time i would come back with that hot coffee he would be gone <laughs> he'd, he'd never be there waiting so years later when i finally got to know him i said paul i gotta ask you something i said as a young man Every time you would send me to get coffee, I said, I would come back with that hot coffee. My arm would be, you know, scalded from running back with it. John, and, and But you would be gone. And Jerry, he looked at me and he said, because you were driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> God, he said, with all them stupid questions, he said, I had to get rid of you. Okay. So, uh, but that's how I got uh, engulfed with it. And, and believe it or not, they beat me up so bad at that school if it was even called a school, that I came back. You came and back. I, I came back. Three days later, I walked back. And I remember the Samoan, they told me that either you're stupid or you must really want to do this. And uh, and I did. And so, believe it or not, a week later, they actually throwed me in a ring because one did, of the- did, did they charge you anything? for didn't getting charge bit of, nothing. Didn't, didn't charge, charge me. But, but you know, guys, what I knew right off the bat is I wanted to be around a wrestling ring. I did. I mean, I, 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 that was my dream. And so they didn't have to tell me then or now to get there early and help set the ring up. And and because I was going to be there. I'm still the first one at these buildings now because I, I just love being around a, a wrestling ring. I love watching them go up and take down. And a lot of the guys hate that. And I love it. And and I I've got a ring on a trailer in my yard and and right now John I'm mad because it's not set up somewhere okay 
I'm mad. I'm going to do a birthday party just to set that ring up, okay? Wow. <laughs> so, uh, but I still wanted to wrestle for Jim Crockett Promotions. That was like the Super Bowl uh, right. here in the Carolinas. And, uh, you know, there was no – every now and then a wrestling magazine in the back would have a promoter's address. And so all we had, if you can imagine, guys, is, is, is we would send eight by tens. Uh, to black and white eight by tens. I, I sent them all over the world. And not one time did anybody ever answer me. Jerry, wow. can you believe that? I, I, I can't believe that. You know, I did. I had to do the same thing when I started. When I, when I, when I changed territories, you had to send, no matter who you were, you had to send those promotional photos out. You know, first time I worked Florida, I walked in and Dutch Mantel was there and he, I told him my name and he said, George South. He said, I think I've got some eight by tens <laughs> by my house on the table. And I'm thinking, well, okay, well, why didn't you answer them? <laughs> why didn't you write me back? But you now, could... South, South is your, your legitimate name? Or... Yeah, it sure is. Uh, you oh, know well, what... oh, well, as long as I've known you, I always thought it was a working name. <laughs> well, you know what? I wanted to be, this is true story. I wanted to be George Jones. So bad. <laughs> I, wanted, oh, I, did, I did too. I did too yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what's funny is I wanted to be Paul Jones' son. Okay. okay. Wow. But Paul never. No, no me. wonder he sent you after the conference. Yes. <laughs> so I was, man, I loved him so much. And he. I did too. Paul told me, he said, no, no, that makes me sound like an old guy. You can't be my son. Yeah. So that, they wouldn't let me. So I just, uh, and I'll tell you. I started out, uh, uh, John, working, uh, well, beginning to wrestle as as Mark Thunder. Where I come up with that name, <laughs> I don't even remember. But, but Jerry, I don't know if you remember an old photographer named Gene Gordon. Gene Gordon, I've been to his house, you know, went to his house several times. Yes. If you, want, if you wanted to photograph, Gene had them all. Man. He got... I, I love looking through his collection. I, I don't know Unbelievable. Well, you know, he, even before Bill After, Gene Gordon was the one that could get you in a wrestling magazine. Right, yeah. Whether it was your name and or your picture. And because he would he would go to he would be at the biggest show of the year one day and then down in some independent show the next. He just loved taking pictures. Well, he started getting me in magazines. And I told all my friends that, man, I'm gonna finally make a wrestling magazine. Well, guess what? It it said Mark Thunder. <laughs> so, so nobody believed me. So I said, screw that. I'm going to start using my real name. So, uh, and I even, I tell you, before I ever got in with Crockett, I got the phone number to Georgia Championship Wrestling in Atlanta. I called and guess what? Buzz Sawyer answered. Can you imagine a young guy I called and Buzz Sawyer? And he told me this. He said, if you come to Atlanta, I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. So I just said, "Okay, I hung okay. the phone up." Like, well, I don't hey, know. I was in, I was in Jim Crockett's office one time, and the eight by tens were there, you know, from guys. And Murdoch was going through them. Dick Murdoch. Wow. <laughs> so wow. Guy, he looked great, but he and down there he goes, "Don't smoke, don't drink." And Dick goes, "He'll never make it." What yeah, that's right. <laughs> I love that. Oh, well, I used to go in Gene's office, Gene Anderson's office. And he would have a wall full of VHS tapes, like that the boys, you know, guys would send in. And, and I said, Gene, have you ever watched one of them? <laughs> he said, heck no, I ain't got time to watch them tapes. <laughs> so there was a lot of tapes that never got watched. But I just didn't give up, Jerry. You know, even when Buzz, uh, Buzz Sawyer said he'd kill me, I, I knew there was a way uh, I just had to find it, and I wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, I would uh, just travel with, uh, uh, you know, some local wrestlers, just anything to be around it. And I tell you, who I love to this day, and I give so much credit, was Mike Jackson, uh, our Mike old Jackson. friend from Alabama. Yeah. Uh, I had tried every avenue to get into wrestling, and all the doors were being shut. And then I was told, just get a hold of Mike Jackson. Yeah, he That's knows there. Mike Mike had so much respect, even at an early age, because he of his sure work, did. because of his work work ethic. And and when he's in his 70s, John, and Mike's still working. Still. And, and 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 having a decent match on top of it. He he sure is. And and what I didn't know at the time is he was sending guys 
to every promotion, every territory out there, he was sending five and ten guys to go work TV. Hey, George, so, now to back up a little bit, now you, okay. you, you, when you got through school, was this right after you got through school? I graduated high school. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wrestling school, the, the wrestling oh, oh. school that you went to. That well, well, they honestly, John, back then it wasn't even called a school. They they was like there was never official training. Like they would throw, you know, I was setting the ring up, and they would uh, maybe throw me in the ring ten or fifteen minutes before the show, and you know, bump me around a little bit. But they never showed me anything. They never like I wasn't even allowed like in the dressing room. Uh, that, that's that's what room. we're finding out by a lot of guys, right, John? I mean. They put you in the ring and they really don't tell you anything. You know, they, right. they don't right. tell you that it's a work or anything. They just don't don't hurt anybody. You know? Well, see, I knew, John, that how long, I mean, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I always thought I was Paul Jones anyway, Gary. I mean, I got old pictures at home where I would, you know, make the U.S. heavyweight belt out of cardboard, you know, because <laughs> Paul. And I'll tell you, John, this is how engulfed I was. There Mass superstar Bill Eady did an angle on television with Paul Jones where he beat Paul in the ring and he took out some old scissors and he, he just scalped Paul. He just cut yeah. gaps out of his hair. Well, as a young man, guess what I did? I went and got scissors and cut gaps out of my hair. <laughs> no, George, no. Yeah, so I went to school and all, you know, everybody said, what in the heck happened to your hair? And I said, you didn't watch the show? I mean, you know, my superstar <laughs> cut my hair. And can you imagine me? Telling Paul Jones this years later when oh. he's thinking, "Man, you're nuts." So I you look like an unmasked name. Jason Voorhees from Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> oh, so so Mike Jackson said, "Sure, you want to go do TV?" Did you get like not referred to the counselor or anything in high school for that? No, no. This, we think this story. kid might have serious problems. The, the, <laughs> John, listen, the bro my brother uh, Bill that that practically raised me. He, I remember he bought me a brand new book bag the first day of school. And my friend at school had a wrestling magazine <laughs> and it, and the guy on the front, I think it was even Jimmy Valiant. He was bleeding from a New York, you know, title match. And I traded that book bag for that magazine. <laughs> Man, I come home, got the beating of my life, but I still have that magazine. Can you believe yeah. that? So, Oh, wow. Man, <laughs> I was going to be a wrestler. So uh, I actually uh, I graduated in high school. Hey, wait a minute. What what did you do with your books? Oh, I left them. I, I, yeah. So you, you traded your book bag. What, what I traded everything. Book? Pencils, the sharpener, the erasers for that one <laughs> magazine. Uh, <laughs> brother, I, and I still have the magazine, John, if you can believe it. but I believe it. And and, you, and, and, go ahead. Well, and, and what I was going to say is I graduated on a Friday and, and, and I remember all my friends from high school were going to go to the beach and they got so mad at me because I had to go to a local independent wrestling show. <laughs> you know, you kidding me? They said, you're going to turn the beach down. We're going to go party, all this kind of stuff. And I said, no, no, I got a show to go to. I got a show. <laughs> and, and I tell you, at, at 18 years old, if you can believe this, uh, uh, Jerry and John, I got to work Luthea's at a wrestling show. And I remember Lou Thez from the magazines and he was still, even at that age was a little bit older, but in great shape. Yeah. And so did, the, did, did you, did you know the magnitude obviously of Lou Thez when, when you're getting, no, no sir, no wow. sir. But he told me quick. He told you he, quick. <laughs> the promoter came over and said, uh, Mr. Thez wants to see you. And so, okay, so, you know, here's this cocky 18-year-old weighing 150 pounds. I, I walked in Luthez's dressing room like I was going to tell him, like, you know, this is, you're going to listen to me, kid. And I didn't get two words out of my mouth. And I remember he stood up and it was like, and up, and up. I mean, yeah, he, he I mean, I, I, it's just the greatest thing I've ever seen. And he just said, well, first you're going to shut up. And uh, I said, okay. And I did. And we actually went out there and now he, it, he was so much of a man. I mean, I can't even explain that Jerry. He was so tough and he took good care of me, but I knew he was there. Like you knew at any moment he could break me in half. But later when I found out that who, I mean, who he really was and all that he had done, it really made me 
uh, early on realized that I probably need to just shut my mouth. <laughs> you know, I probably just need to listen more. And so it, that led, if you can believe it, to um, uh, just traveling a little bit. And then the original Sheik, the one from Detroit, he had came into the Carolinas and they needed a guy for the Sheik to just beat up. Now, every wrestling magazine in the 70s had the Sheik on the front. I mean, the snake and the pencil. And, and, and so I volunteered. I did. Uh, I said, yes. Who did and, you volunteer through, George? Well, there was a guy, there was an old promoter named Johnny Hunter that lived in the Carolinas, and he would run, uh, he would actually run some pretty good shows. Now, Crockett hated him because he wasn't competition, but he he had a good following. Yeah, but he, he was there, always, yeah. Yes, sir. He, he would bring in at least one, like, former name, maybe Crazy Luke Graham or someone like that. And and for some reason, uh, the first night, I, I took such a good butt whooping from the sheep that he asked for me the second night. And I remember these words are etched in my mind. The sheep looked right at me and he said, You're, he said, I'm not going to hurt you, kid, and you sure ain't going to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> but man, I'm going to tell you, I'm 61 years old and I'll never forget being in the ring with the sheep. And John, he pulls that pencil out. And that's when you just freeze. I mean, you're thinking, I'm fixing to die. But if I do, it's going to be at the hands of the sheep. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I, I carry on to this day is the showmanship and the atmosphere of when the sheep came to the ring. Jerry, it was unheard of. I mean, it was, I wish I could go back and capture that from the time he left the dressing room to the time he got in the ring and people literally want to kill him. I mean, and he, he had the snake, he had the prayer rug and it would be 30 minutes in the match and it would be a riot and we hadn't even touched yet. And I learned so much just by watching him and how he would, uh, I remember I asked the ref one time, I said, when's he going to be ready to like lock up? And the ref said, pay attention. He said he's uh, he's like an orchestra conductor, Jerry. He was it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, John. He was making the people stand and sit down when he wanted to, and I've never it, it was unbelievable to watch as a young man how he catapult. I mean, he just had that crowd wanting to kill him, and he hasn't done anything. And so when we finally did, of course, I was the, the good looking, you know, baby face and, and the sheep just beat me up. And, and then he gave me a little comeback. And then of course he beat me with the camel clutch and man. And so he asked for me the second night. Did you have to get color? Yes, I did. Now, yes, so I did. What, what was your reaction? Did you know anything about color? Or anything? Well, I, I, I kind of experimented on my own. Oh, Here, no. I did. I'm telling In high you, school. <laughs> think, yeah, Jim, you know, Jim class and Jim class or oh, well John I'm telling you I'm thinking well either I'm going to do this myself or that pencil is and I think <laughs> you know it just seemed a little bit easier with with you, you with didn't me. want lead poison right no I did not want lead poison <laughs> but he and we beca I became friends with with the sheik even up after that so every time Johnny Hunter would bring in uh, Mighty Igor he would bring Mighty Igor in and work some towns in the Carolinas, and and I would be the guy. And so I learned early, early on what my place was in professional wrestling. And that you could make some money with that position. I could make some good money. And, you know, to this day, uh, Jerry, you know, people, fans will call me a loser, and, and you never won a match. And I'm thinking, I bought five houses never winning a match. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like, they, there's some that still don't still don't get it. Uh, I used to work. Oh, it's it's not it's not real when you win. It's not real when you lose. Oh my goodness, John! I, I used Very to wrestle. Simple. I used to wrestle Magnum TA, uh, and you know his finish was the belly belly to back. But he would beat you in like three minutes, like three seconds sometimes. And I would be leaving like the old Greenville Auditorium, Jerry, that you worked at many times. Right. I remember one night Magnum beat me in like six seconds. And I was leaving the ring and the old security guard was helping me and the fans were throwing, 
you know, beer on me, calling me a loser. And uh, the security guard looked over and he said, they just don't get it. He <laughs> said, they, I said, they sure don't get it. So, and I just, man, every place that there was a ring uh, through Mike Jackson, uh, in one week, I wrestled for uh, Bill Watts, uh, Eddie Graham, uh, uh, Jim Crockett, uh, stopped in Pensacola to work for the Arms uh, Bob Armstrong. This is all in one week. And of course, I'm losing every week, but I am having the time of my life. And and to this day, I I, I think that's why I'm still doing it. I try to recapture those, you know, that time, that moment uh, that was so special just traveling. But Mike Jackson, you know, here, here's a funny thing about our business. I, I wasn't a smart kid, but I knew that Mike Jackson is not going to do all this for me because he just likes me. I knew there was something. I didn't know what a booking fee was, <laughs> Jerry, but I knew something. So I remember Mike Jackson told me up front, he said, listen, he said, you're going to make 40 bucks a TV and I'm going to take 20. And I said, well, you can take the whole 40. I mean, I'm going to be on TV with Jerry Lawler and, 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 you know, Ric Flair and, and, and Black Jack Mulligan. And are you kidding me? So I never had a problem. I remember the boys, Pez Watley and some of my friends, they used to rib me real bad about, I can't believe you're paying Mike Jackson. But if they knew the journey that I tried on my own to get, you know, I, first TV I ever done was Georgia Championship Wrestling. I walked in. This was before Tommy Richards. What, what, was Buzz still there? Buzz wasn't there because <laughs> I wasn't going to use my name. That's for sure. John. But but this was before. So when Buzz finally got killed, you were happy. You're like, oh, oh, good. I can go to Georgia now. Listen, this is a true story. He asked me to borrow a knee pad one time, and me, the young Greenhorn, I gave him my knee pad. Well, he got out of the ring, John, and didn't give me my knee pad back. Now listen, Jerry, I said, I'm going to follow him to the parking lot. I'm going to get my knee pad back. So this is a true story. I followed him out of TBS studios down to the parking lot. He's still in his gear. He gets in his car and I, you know, I'm not, I'm smart enough not to stand in front of his car, but so he takes my knee pad off and throws it in front of the car. So I'm on the sidewalk. I can't make this stuff up, Jerry. I'm on the sidewalk while Mad Dog Bus Sawyer's revving his engine. Like, is this kid dumb enough to, to take a chance to get his knee pad back? Now he did, you know, it came to a happy ending. He didn't he didn't run over me, but I got my knee pad back. <laughs> you got your knee pad. But you know, I'm sitting in Georgia Championship Wrestling dressing. Wait, 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 what a jerk though. Why he, what a he jerk. stole your knee pad. <laughs> stole my knee pad, the only knee pad I had. And, and he, so, he's making a couple of hundred K a year and that Georgia on, on, on his, on his and, and he walked right out with my knee pad and knew, he knew he did it. And so, well, but I got that knee pad back and I learned quick. I don't never give anybody a knee pad now, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I walk in, I was 18 years old. I'm sitting in the Georgia championship wrestling dressing room. This was before now Ted Turner had not got his big satellite was fixing to explode. And that's when Tommy Rich was the the was big. This on, was this on Techwood Avenue? The old it was on Tech. Yes, okay, it was. Yeah. Yes, now sir. You, it was. If you were privileged, you got John. You got to dress in Ted Turner's office. He he told Jack and I all the time, "You go dress in my office." Jack. Oh wow! <laughs> oh well, we never. I never got that, Jerry. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but he, no, no, but I walked in. And, hey, and no he, one else did either. It, it was no, the Briscoe <laughs> brothers. The Briscoe brothers got that. Yes, they got it. And and you know, Tommy Rich at that time was the biggest baby face in the world. He, I mean, it was just everybody. Everybody was coming in to wrestle on TV oh, because it, it was it went all over the world, uh, Jerry. And and what's so special as you know is I miss this so much. Nobody hated nobody. I'm sure the guys had feuds or or a little bit of heat, but anybody could come in there. Like I would, the first day I'm sitting there, and there's Jerry Lawler, there's Rip Oliver from Portland, there's uh, you know Billy Jack Haynes was coming through there. It was just like somebody Harley Race came through. It was like a Dick Slater. It's like somebody from every territory was in the dressing room. And my get first, on that TV, man. Get on that. Man, get on that TV. TV. And I tell you, my first TV match ever 
was with Jerry the King Lawler, if you can believe it. And I knew about him in the magazines, John, but I didn't know that his finish was the fist drop. You know, off his finish was the fist drop off the second rope. Well, he tells me that he's going to use the pile driver. So I knew what a pile driver was. So we get out there and have a little match. Well, he forgot. So he does the fist drop. And guess what? I kicked out. <laughs> I kicked out of the fist drop, John, on two, on the two count. And literally, when I got back, Ole Anderson picked me up. I didn't even have a shirt on. He picked me up by my throat and put me against the wall. And he cussed me. He said, do you understand that Jerry Lawler has beat Flair? He's beat Hogan. He's beat everybody <laughs> with the fist drop. With the fist drop. But you kicked out. <laughs> now, luckily, Lawler came over and said, no, no, that was my fault. I forgot I had told him the, you know, I had told him the, the pile driver. And so he... You know, only kind of put me down. He didn't apologize. And and I tell you, three weeks later, the world changed. That's when Jim Crockett walked in the dressing room. Okay? Now, it's it was funny for me because I was so unimportant, but you had guys like Ox Baker and Mike Davis and Tommy Lane. They had just left Jim Crockett to go to Georgia to try to get a fresh start. Jerry, well, guess what? Here comes Jim Crockett, and I'll never forget it. He said, I want to introduce the new booker of Georgia Championship Wrestling. And he walked out, and the American dream, Dusty Rhodes, walks in. The doors were swinging like John Wayne just walked in. Now, here's our business, guys. Dusty took out a sheet of paper. You hear the boys now in our business say that wrestling owes them something or they're entitled to something. They're not entitled to nothing. Dusty took out a sheet of paper and he said, these are the guys I'm keeping. And if your name ain't on the list, pack your bags. Jerry, he read a list of names because we all knew he was going to bring in his new regime, you know, rock and roll and all them and which made history. But, but guys like uh, Ox Baker, Mike Davis, Tommy Lane, their names was not on the list. And I remember, that, John, here's how goofy I was. I remembered I was sitting over in the corner, and I didn't hear my name. Like, I was important, right? Like, I'm thinking, Dusty must have forgot me. Uh, nobody, uh, even, nobody even knew me. So I go over to Dusty, and I said, Mr. Dream, I said, uh, I, I did. I called him Mr. Dream. Can you believe that? <laughs> we just finished this meeting where he fired all of these these veterans, and here comes this stupid kid over. And I said, Mr. Dream, I said, I, I noticed that that my name wasn't called. And he looked right at me, and he said, son, he said, you're not important enough to be on either list. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, okay, John. So I just went back over and sat in my corner and, and just <laughs> shut up. Uh, but and, and so it started slowly changing. It, you know, uh, as Dusty started bringing in his guys, but but I still knew that they needed somebody for these TV matches. And so I just went out, and it sounds, you know, old school nowadays, but I just went out there and did did my job. And uh, I still loved it. I mean, I, I took a lot of guys that probably didn't have a clue what they were doing and learned to to put them where I needed them to be for them to beat me. Uh, and I made a great, great living. And then it just, it, this is how our business is so great. One day, Dusty saw my address, Jerry, and he realized that I was living in Charlotte, but I was driving to Atlanta every Saturday morning. And buddy, listen, we had to be there at 8 a.m. in the yeah, morning. Yeah, what do you live at 3 a.m. in the morning? I was living at 3 a.m. And you remember this year, John, they had to keep the studio freezing because the cameras back then would overheat so you're going out there at wrestling at like 9 a.m and, and, and then there are maybe 20 people in the studio but it would be freezing cold so the cameras wouldn't overheat so you, you know you're talking about okay and, and a lot of the boys would squirt your head you know so it looked like you were sweating and ready but man i was freezing and then you would get out there and all of a sudden here would come abdullah the butcher and, and everybody that I saw in a magazine, and Jerry, here was the most special thing in the world, John. 
they would tape in the morning and at 6.05 that night, they would show it back on television. Man. So, you know what? They asked Ted Turner one time, why didn't you start your wrestling at 6? Why did you start at 6.05? You know what he said that I love? He said, I didn't want to compete with the Andy Griffin show. <laughs> you know, the Andy Griffin was a big deal on the Superstation. And they started at 6, so he wanted to start at 6.05. So I would do TV that morning, work two or three times, jump in my car, and rush home so I could sit there and watch myself get beat up. Now, man, what a life that was. Hey, Jerry, I've always been curious because Memphis did the same thing of of taping early in the morning (laughs) for their TV show. Why did they tape so early in the morning? It just seems dumb to me. I mean, I don't, why didn't they tape on Friday night, Thursday night? Like, uh, you know, they did that. Well, 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 Friday night, Friday night was your Monday night, your house show night. So they, yeah. you know, Friday night at the Civic Auditorium, our city auditorium there in Atlanta, they're not going to give up a $10,000 house. So, and, and, and then John, as he said, those cameras were huge and there weren't portable cameras. There weren't handheld cameras or anything like that. So you could do a remote guy. Uh, Unless you set it up way in advance, so and, and it calls for heavy. But uh, the morning, you had other shows. You yeah yeah you, you had TV in the afternoon in Atlanta, mm-hmm. and then you then you had two house shows that night at somewhere around Carrollton or Griffin, Georgia, something like that. Right. So you basically just so you didn't have to show the same show show twice. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you did, exactly. you taped it on Friday. The people that saw it live, they're not probably not going to watch it on Saturday. They're not going to watch it on six uh, on Saturday, Saturday, correct, or Sunday. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, it was, it was like, just, in, it was like just, in Dallas, just, the Sportatorium, they had the cameras set up there full yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they, like even here, we were we owned our own building here in Florida. You know, the Sportatorium here here in, in, in Tampa, but we had a house show that would draw six thousand people weekly in Miami. So, you know, you you had to do that TV tape. That's the reason we did it so early here. We do it at 8 o'clock in the morning here in Tampa. They get in the car, drive five hours down to Miami so you can make a, a big house show down there. So that was just basically logistics and stuff like that. It wasn't right. one easy, one easy, one easy uh, you know, well, it gives us time to edit the show because they didn't do too much editing in those shows. Back so you went Atlanta. for decades without sleeping on Friday night. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Friday yeah. night and Tuesday nights. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, that's true. Uh, and Tampa, right. <laughs> you'd have it. You know, it seemed like you always had your home t- territory town, which was the b- biggest town running the night before TV. And you know, in Tampa, you have those big shows. It'd be summertime, you're really hot. You'd be wanting to go to the local honky tonk to have a couple of brews. You know, right. and, the and heat has got nothing to do with it. <laughs> no, well, I just my excuse, John, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and remember, Jerry, those cameras would be on a big wheel. They'd be on. Oh yeah, big wheels that you would just roll. Yeah, 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 one of those big like like a bumper car type deal. You'd have to stand around there. But yeah, it would. And like George said, man, it'd be so damn cold. You get up at seven, at six a.m., make TV at seven. Oh. What and, and and freezing cold outside. You walk in that studio. And it's even colder in that damn studio. It You're doing is. everything in the world to try to loosen up. So when you go out there, you got some some blood running through your body. Yeah. But it was hard, man. <laughs> so, George, you were doing TV in Georgia, but you were working in the Carolinas? Well, uh, until uh, I, I lived in Charlotte and still wasn't involved with Jim Crockett. I couldn't get in uh, for Jim Crockett. So my first getting my feet wet was Georgia championship wrestling and uh, uh like jerry said they would run macon georgia maybe you know that night so if uh, I, I picked up a lot of shows from some of the boys just being stupid and missing missing shows and no showing and stuff so man i, I loved it like there was a lot of boys, that going there were a lot of that going on back then too. the boys <laughs> being stupid I never, I, can, <laughs> no. you, can, you, can you imagine that so there was uh, a lot going on back in those days in the 70s, I, I, I <laughs> For various so, reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Dusty just saw my address one day that where I had lived in uh, live in Charlotte, and he said, "Well, I didn't know that you, uh, you know, were driving. I mean, I didn't know you lived in Charlotte." So he said, "If anything opens up in Charlotte, uh, you know, we will we will give we'll give it to you." And so that's how I was able to get my footwork, uh, my foot wet into Jim Crockett and doing the TVs, and then I. 
And it all came down to just, and, and I know us old guys, we, we wear it out, but I never had to tell anybody where I had been or, or this is even in the eighties. I never had to like say, well, I just got back from Georgia. It's like, they knew if I kept my mouth shut and worked hard, uh, John, I know that's unheard of nowadays, but, but they knew about me. I mean, they did. It's like that old saying, the word of mouth, even in the territory days, uh, because even back then, we just all, you know, even the top guys just wanted to make money. They didn't want to hassle. They didn't want to work with somebody. You don't know how many TVs I would sit back and watch the monitor. And two guys, I saw two guys go in the ring with Rick Steiner and Mike Rotundo one time, if you can imagine. And the other guys thought they were going over. No. I mean, <laughs> Jerry, they thought that they were going to win that match. And I, literally, that lasted about two minutes. <laughs> and 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 so I knew then, okay, I'm not a smart man, but I'm never going to do that, okay? So it was just, you just checked it off the list, okay? Well, I'm smarter than those two guys. And, and I'll tell you a funny story. They came back to the dressing room after Steiner and Rotundo had just <laughs> beat him to death. And remember in the old cartoons when somebody would get shoved into a trash can and all you would see is their legs and their head. You wouldn't see their body. Rick and Rotundo in the dressing room took both of those guys and shoved them <laughs> in these metal trash cans. Really? You see the car, shoved them straight in the trash cans. <laughs> right in front of all the boys and everything. And, and nobody said a word to them. And you're sitting there thinking, well, how, who's going can, <laughs> how can two guys be that stupid? <laughs> So Steiner and Rotundo got those two guys and shoved so them in a be, trash can in the dressing room. Two of the they most legit guys, guys in the history of Oh, yeah, two badasses. <laughs> yes. And, and, and I'm thinking that was a stupid thing to do, but with those two guys anyway. So my whole career, I've just tried to do the opposite that I've seen a lot of the, you know, the <laughs> boys do. And, and you know, Jerry, what was so amazing? Like Jim Crockett didn't have a wrestling school. Of course, you remember Nelson Royal, who we, we both yeah. loved so much. Yeah, but buddy had Gene and Ole going down to Park Center on uh, yes, he did. Saturday morning. You, you, see, never had, you never had to do that? I, I'll tell you a funny story, uh, John. Back in my wild days, I'd actually met Gene Anderson's daughter uh, in a nightclub. Can you believe that? And so the only reason I dated her was trying to get <laughs> close to Gene Anderson. And later... I mean, she, you know, she was a nice girl, but all I'm thinking is, when are you going to invite me over? I <laughs> mean, I got Gene Gene's jacket. Going, I'm going to see Gene. Yeah. And so many times I would go pick her up and I would just kill time to see if Gene was there. That's how bad I was. But he was always on the road. So, so hey, not, you, not to go back right quick, who let him out of the trash cans? They're probably still there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, because see, the boys watched it it was comical for the boys because we watched it uh on the monitor and you could just tell because they wouldn't sell nothing at all uh and of course then rick then you saw the momentum change where rick steiner made you sell and you and rotundo made you sell and you knew when it got back when they got back through the curtain that there was, was going to be some serious selling it, it was better than <laughs> it was better than the actual match and 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 the sad part about it those guys I never saw them anywhere else. You never saw them <laughs> in no another territory. You never saw them at another TV. And and I mean, just what? How stupid can you be? I always knew my job. I always knew, and, and a lot of times it was real hard. I'm gonna tell you. Um, but just to go out there and and some of these, as you know, some of these guys had just been breaking. You know, WCW used to do a dark match, Jerry, and in between TV they would bring a new guy in and every TV, they would call for George South to go work this guy. And I'm going to tell you, it was amazing because uh, Nails, for instance, who was in WWE, he, he came down, worked a dark match. I had a little match with him. It was in between the tapes. You know what? They brought in Dale Wilkes from AWA before the Patriot. Wahoo brought him down. And believe it or not, Jerry, we went out, and 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 I love Dale Wilkes. He had a great body on him oh, yeah. and could work. And when we got done, I thought, surely WCW is going to hire this kid way before the Patriot. He never, he never got a call back, never. 
And we became great friends later. He always said I killed and his he, he, was, he was just uh, coming off of being an All-American football player. All-American, yes, in South Carolina. He sure did. Yeah. And he was doing like this uh, state straight, a state trooper gimmick in AWA. A little a trooper had and Wahoo had brought him down. And I thought, here's this great-looking kid, great body, great amateur. He could wrestle, great athlete. But they never called him back. And, and later he said, I killed his career, you know, with that little dark. <laughs> I killed his career. But well, you know, George, well, George, I was, you were at his first. I, that was my one chance. <laughs> I kept a job and they never hired him. But you know, special moments that the fans don't know about, John, is Eddie Guerrero actually came through before, before anybody even knew who he was. And I worked a little dark match. Uh, in between WCW tapings with Eddie Guerrero. And only probably a couple hundred people ever saw it. Now, he didn't even get a call back. Can you believe that? <laughs> and it was much later when they brought him back uh, to, to to WCW, and he, he worked there for a while. But, but it was like every time a guy came through for them to take a look at, uh, Buff Bagwell, uh, his very first, they just brought him from Dallas, uh, the, the global, the GWF, and he came in, he worked a little dark match, and of course they called on, uh, you know, me, and, and I loved it. I, I'm not saying that was a bad thing at all, is I, I love going out there and, and just working with all, Art Barr, the juicer, I don't know if y'all remember him, no, John, no. you know, he, uh, Jerry, he was in Portland, Art Barr, and they brought him, he was Jesse Barr's brother. They brought Art Barr down to WCW, and they painted his face as the juicer, that movie had just hit it big. And so they brought him in. He had silly string and uh, everything, the powder. And so we go out and, look, and worked a little dark match. Yeah, yeah it was that powder. It was that powder that got him. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. But he was over like a million bucks. But in three weeks, he was gone. Yeah, yeah and there it, was a lot of him. powder in locker rooms back then. <laughs> <laughs> and after three weeks, he was gone. He ran out. <laughs> well, and, and you know, uh, uh, Jerry, I mentioned. Uh, uh, you know the booking fee, John. That that for me to to do what I was now, able. How to... how long did that booking fee last with Mike? Well, probably five years. Wow. Because Jerry, he took me all over. So the so world. Mike Mike, you bought five houses. Mike bought ten houses with uh, you. Mike bought <laughs> ten houses. Okay, Mike, and, and he's got a picture, a little five by seven of me on his kitchen table too. <laughs> yeah. But you know, and I remember sitting in that dressing room and the boys telling me, George, you don't have to do that. And I'm thinking, well. Yeah, I do, because I've tried every other possible way. And here's the most funny thing is later when I started getting, you know, a, a little bit of credibility and I could book guys, I sure wasn't going to get you a booking and not get nothing out of it. Right. Yeah. Now, in, ex point. in exchange, Jerry, I did all the, I, I went to bat for you. Like I made the phone calls. I spoke up for you. I got you that booking. And I'm not doing that just because, you know, I, I like you. And so, George, how, how many years did, did you work before you transitioned into, into doing what you do? Well, you know, as I was, uh, uh, and I still, believe it or not, to this day, thank the good Lord, I still, you know, I wrestle about four days a week. And, really? Uh, yes, sir. And, and, Jerry, and John, I, what's funny is I take my students in there with me and I just, I just fall on them now. You know, I just land on them instead of bumping. So that, that's <laughs> giving me a good career. But when you would call Jim Crockett's office to be a wrestler, the call was given to Gene Anderson. And at that time, Jerry, listen to this. Nelson Royal, as you know, he owned that Western store. That ranch, that ranch out more. Ranch. And Jerry, can you believe I, 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 I rode two Brahma Bulls out on that. Uh, Did you? I now, had met I was all two Brahma bulls out oh. there. Now, now that's John, where you got hurt, wasn't it, Jerry? That's where yeah. I pulled my growing to Jim Crockett Sr. and they fired me. and never they fired Nelson Roll for putting me on there. Should have wow. fired the bull. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you know, John. Well, we, know we, ate, we ate him the next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, 30 minutes north of Charlotte, North Carolina, a little town called Mooresville, Nelson owned this huge ranch. Uh, it was a shoot ranch. I mean, it was a rodeo. And ranch. a beautiful, and beautiful place, man. And, and you know, he owns a wet. He owned a western store. Jerry. He had a western store. It. He had all that. Stuff, well, man. well, this would break your heart because now the city 
bought all of the land, of course, and tore all the barns and all that down, but his store is still there. Wow. If you can believe it. Now, his son runs it. Uh, wow. Still runs it to this day. But behind it, all of that's gone. Well, back in the day, Nelson put a ring up in his barn. And so if you wanted to be a wrestler, instead of taking you to the old Coliseum and, and stretching you, you would come up to the barn. And I remember one night, Jerry Nelson Royal called me, John, about 10 at night. He said, George, you want to work out? And I said, well, Nelson, it's kind of late. But yeah. So I drove to Mooresville. I get to his barn. And there's one light on in that barn. And I mean, there's horses in this barn where the ring was. And so I go in. And there's nobody there yet. So I had my little gym bag, Jerry, and I'm thinking, well, some of the guys probably going to come and, you know, in off the road and work out. Well, here walks in Nelson Royal, who was always in tip-top shape, Jerry, as you knew. But it's just me and him and, like, five horses, <laughs> okay, like 1030 at night. So I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, we're waiting on some people. Well, next thing I know, Nelson unzips his bag. And he pulls out, you know, those rubber bands where he's going to warm up. Right. Yeah, okay. Always carried those. Oh, always carried them. And he starts putting baby oil on. <laughs> you know? And for I'm the horses in his barn. Nelson. I Roy. know. I mean, for who? Oh. For the horses? For the horses. For the horses. <laughs> I promise you it's for the horses. <laughs> so, Jerry, I'm sitting there thinking, man, this man's going crazy. I mean, I thought we was just going to get in there and roll around and, you know, work on some headlocks and stuff. And, man, he's over there doing push-ups. <laughs> and he's got his boots on. And I'm thinking, this is where I'm going to die. <laughs> I mean, this is where Nelson – but he took – nothing was ever a game to Nelson. It was serious business. Yeah. So, he, we got in that ring, John, and, and for the next hour and a half, he beat me to death. I mean, he, <laughs> he was like a shoot. And to this day – I, I, like you just said, John, to this day, I think he was showing off in front of them horses. <laughs> I, I, do, I do, because them horses would watch, and, and he would stretch me and chop me and, and look over at the horses. And so I, I think I was so dumb to just, well, not dumb, but I respected Nelson, that he fell in love with me. And so here, picture this. When Jim Crockett shut down and left, Guess who stepped in that nobody wants to talk about? Nelson, uh, Nelson Royal stepped in and started running the ACW here in Mooresville two weeks after Crockett sold. So he had all of the high schools, all of the big buildings that Crockett was running. Nelson Royal was running them. And he brought, for his first line of business, he brought the Rock and Roll Express in, who, who before was the hottest thing in the world in the Carolinas. And for three years, we did unbelievable business for Nelson. But here's where the downfall was, Jerry, and I know you would understand this, uh, John, too, is Nelson would try to do everything himself. Like, I used to say, Nelson, let me help you hang posters. Let me help you. But he was such uh, just a hard worker. And, and I miss that so much, Jerry, that, that it ain't that he didn't trust me, but he – it was just too big, and but he tried to oversee everything, and I mean it. I mean, he you would see Nelson Royal, the legend, the NWA junior champ, still going out meeting uh, sponsors and and meeting uh, uh, people, and you putting posters up in their windows, and he loved doing it, but he just wouldn't let nobody help. It just got too much for him. Uh, but I learned a valuable lesson. Nelson Royal walks in one day to the dressing room, one of his last shows, and he said, I've sold the letters. I said, you did what? He said, yeah, there's a guy bought ACW. And I, I'm thinking, huh? Like, you can sell letters? <laughs> he said, oh, he didn't get the company or the ring or nothing. He just bought ACW for like 10 grand. And I said, Nelson, what are we going to do? He said, I'm just going to come up with some new letters. <laughs> <laughs> so y'all thought, oh, man, I learned that lesson. So even hey, now. Did, did I, he ever call you again late at night <clears throat> to come wrestle him? Well, you know what? He still made appearances like early on in some of the conventions that started in Charlotte. He would still come and, and still carry that bag. 
Now he he would have gotten that bag. Did he did he get your knee pad? No, he didn't get my knee pad. <laughs> I would have gave it to him. Oh, hey, did I, did I, you I ever like Buzz Sawyer threatened to kill you? Did he know who you were when you showed up? He never did. You know, and I hate to talk of anybody, but you know, I saw a young kid come up to Buzz Saw uh, Sawyer one time on television in Atlanta. Just this young guy. And he told Buzz, he said, my family is coming in town to, to this TV taping to, to watch. And, I, and, and I'm not saying the young kid was right to even say this, but he asked Buzz if he could just get a little spot, if he could just get, you know, a little arm ringer, John, or something, because his family had traveled to come. And I remember Buzz looked at him and said, uh, yeah, I'd give you something. And so, of course, he didn't, and he just uh, uh, beat this young kid up probably, uh, you know, uh, worse than he would have anyway in front of that kid's family. And, and, you know, just little things like that, uh, it sticks with you. He didn't have to be that way. You know, he didn't. I mean, what would it have hurt to take a hip toss from this young kid, John, you know, in front of his family? I mean, come on. And, and. Uh, but but he didn't, and just what little things. What would it hurt just not to steal your knee pad? Hey, uh, exactly. <laughs> but you know, the boys walk up to me now, John, and they think I'm just some old grouch in the dressing room. <laughs> you know, Jerry, they'll ask me for risk tape, and I'll say no. And if they knew what I've been through <laughs> <laughs> to get this risk tape, they wouldn't <laughs> ask me that. <laughs> so, but but you know, and so. I started helping Nelson at his school when him and Gene had it. And, and, and Jerry, I'll tell you a funny story. One day, John, WWF calls. Tony, call, Tony Gurria called Nelson Royal and said, we need some guys. We want to bring some new faces to TV. And I had never worked for WWF, Jerry. I'd never been on all my TVs. And Nelson said, yes, how many guys? Tony Gurria said, I need 10 guys. So Nelson Royal came to me and he said, George, can you get me 10 guys? I said, I can get you 20. And I'm going to tell you, my first experience that wrestling was huge. Like every territory I went to, John, they were still carrying the rings on a flatbed truck. I'm serious. A few gimmick tables were set up and a local lady would run it or whatever. So the first TV I ever went back in the day to WWF, we land at the arena and Jerry, there's like six transfer trucks with the WWF logo on them, John. And I'm thinking, whoa, wait a minute. For me now, coming from, you know, the Carolinas and, and, and Atlanta and all that, I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, and you and were you're, coming from big, hot territories. Unbelievable. And it was still... Two guys with a ring. There was no ring crews. It was two guys using some local guys with a ring on a flatbed truck. Now, they were drawing a tremendous amount of money, but it was just never that next level. And I tell you, when I first went to WWF, how, you talk about uh, uh, being intimidated. The plane was late, so me and the other nine guys were late getting to the arena. So we just go in a back door. John, guess who the first? What, what arena was it? You remember? Uh, Syracuse. It was the old TV. Uh, oh my goodness. Uh, War, Ma War Memorial. War Memorial. Yes, War Memorial. Rotten building. Yes. But one of the walk. worst buildings in the world. <laughs> worst. Yeah. And, and, and John, we walk in the back and you'll never guess the first person for WWF I ever met was Vince McMahon. Not an agent. Well, not you started at the top. I started at the top. And you know the thing that impresses me to this day? He turned around, and of course I knew who he was, but we were scared to death. We were late, yeah. and he's the first guy. The first thing he did, listen to me, Jared, the first thing Vince McMahon done was he called every one of our names out. Like he said, George South, Tommy Angel, David Isley, and he went down the list. He knew, you know, and I'd always heard that, you know, Vince McMahon knows everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the wrestling business. And it he actually, did, I yeah, I, I mean, I'm serious. And what's the chances that first we would run into him and second that he would he would know all of our we weren't just a bunch, but it made us feel good, if that makes sense, Jerry. We uh, weren't just does, yeah. 
a group of guys that Nelson Royal sent to TV. Uh, and, and Vince had told us, we'll be sure and tell Nelson hello for me. And so my first five minutes in a WWF setting uh, brought a calmness over me, uh, uh, John, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, then, yeah. but then I think I drew the Ultimate Warrior's name that day, so that changed. Well, that the ruined day. your calmness, didn't it? <laughs> it ruined everything. Okay, that, that this true story, Jared. He hit me so hard with the clothesline, it knocked me out, and then he cussed me out that I couldn't get back up to take another one. <laughs> you sure wasn't Layfield you was working with? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you, boy, but I was knocked out. I, 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 he he told me that I hurt his arm with my chin <laughs> uh, and of course i apologized yeah. <laughs> sorry about that but i knew then that you know dorothy is not in kansas anymore when i started going to wwf and and i remember uh tony Garia come over see see i was used to like even with wcw you may get a check but it would come like once a month yeah. so you didn't get paid till for a month or even uh, uh, you working for Georgia Championship Wrestling, they would pay you cash in a little brown envelope. Your money would be folded. But I get to WWF, and Tony Gurria tells me that, he said, George, have you gotten line yet to get paid? Now, Jerry, I'm thinking, excuse me? He said, yeah, uh, uh, the great manager, uh, Arnold Scholar. Arnold Scholar, Scholar, yes. Scholar, Scholar, money man. Yes, he would come in and sit at the table, open up his little Heidelberg, and you would get in line. Yeah, he didn't. Jared, he didn't need a handcuff on it. Nobody was going to take that from Arnie. Oh God, man. No, they wouldn't, John. And 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 you would get in line, and I couldn't believe it. It was like the greatest thing in the world. Wow. And I le I left that building, those shows that night with with money in my hand. And I'm you thinking, turned you turned into Mike Jackson that night, man. I'm telling you what. <laughs> and, and so every guy. Here's the funny thing about all this, and we can move on. Is is the guys I was taking to WWE TV, WWF back then, I was getting a booking fee from them. Like I paid for the rental car. I paid for the rental van. We drove up the times we didn't fly. And I could take anybody I wanted. They just wanted 10 guys, but I'm not going to do that for free. I'm not going to do that. And see, if the guys messed up on TV, Jerry, guess who got the heat for it? Me. You know? So – for years, and now you're the one that ran your face into Ultimate Warrior's arm. <laughs> yes, I'm the one that hurt his arm with my face. I'm going to get paid for that. But here's how special our business is. One of the first trips up, I take Matt and Jeff Hardy with me. Wow. Nobody even knew who they were. Now, listen to this. The first TV, Vince looked at them and said, they're too little. Because they were very small boys back then. They said, they're too little. I am, I'm not going to use them. So the first TV, they didn't even get to work. So two weeks later, Nelson needs 10 more guys. And guess what? I throw the Hardys back in that van. And I take them up, and this time, they, they use them. So the night that they had the famous match, I think one of them worked Scott Hall, I think. Uh, Jeff Hardy did, I think, that night. The next was history. But listen to this, Jerry. I charged the Hardy boys a booking fee. All right. <laughs> now, now listen to this. For years, I was like the biggest heel in wrestling that nobody that didn't understand the booking fee hated me. Even the Hardy boys in their first book wrote that they didn't even understand that. But see, nobody would have got in without me in that booking fee. Now, they are the great friends to this day, and we laugh about it, but they had to have a way, a door to get in. And now we laugh because they've done so well for their self. Are you uh, still getting a booking fee from them? Yeah, yeah. Still trying to. <laughs> uh, matter of uh, it was a funny, and nobody got this but me the, the other week. The Hardys were working on television, and 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 Chris Jericho's doing the commentating, and he he sticks this in there over the airways. He says, "Well, nobody's got as much out of Matt Hardy as George South has." He <laughs> says it. He says it right over the awesome. Uh, awesome. Of course, I pop for it, but yeah. <laughs> so my students, I, I said all that to say, my students now see how successful the Hardy Boys are. 
So they tell me, George, can you, can you take advantage of me? <laughs> they say, George, can you take a booking fee for me if that's what it leads to? But, but Jerry, there was no way to get in. Right. There was no way. And here's the funny thing, and I'll, and I'll move on. The whole time I was charging those guys a booking fee in that van, Nelson Royal and Gene Henderson were charging me a booking fee. Yeah. <laughs> John, they weren't just letting me go to TV for WWF for free. So I was paying a booking fee even to accept a booking fee. What an amazing business, uh, Jerry. But Jerry, I got to tell you a quick story. I about forgot it. We got a lot to talk about, but I got to share this with you because he's he will be listening to this. I've got an older friend named Carol Hall. He lives in Mount Airy, North Carolina. And now, Jerry, he saw you. He's an older fella. He saw you and Jack many times uh, here in the Carolinas uh, at the Old Park Center in Winston-Salem and places. Just a tremendous uh, uh, man and a great friend. Well, in 2005, he never he didn't get out much, but he wanted to come to a Fan Fest convention in Charlotte. And your brother, Jack, was there, was going to make an appearance. And so Carol, he said, George, I, I can only stay. He said, you know, uh, it, it's hard for me to stand. And, and he was an older fellow. He said, but if I could get a chance just to tell Jack how much he meant to me. Now, this was before the convention opened, and it was in 2005. And I want to share this with you real quick because I'll forget it. Is I said, Carol, I'll, I'll do what I can. I said, this thing's going to be huge. People are waiting outside already. And, and I know Jack's going to be busy, but I'll try. So I got Carol Hall in about 10 minutes before they opened the doors. And Jerry, I tell you, I'll get emotional. Jerry, Jack had just got there and I took Carol over to Jack. And I said, Jack, I said, sir, I know you're busy and we're getting ready to open this convention doors, but this man has wanted to meet you his whole life. And I'm going to tell you something. I get I get emotional because your 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 brother did not just say yeah I'm glad to meet you uh, talk to you later I I'm hot because Jack and Carol sat down at a table and they talked for a solid hour now I'm mad because I'm not included Jerry but Jack sat down and if they had not if Carol Hall to this day still talks about that. That, that time that he got to spend, and I'll never forget, he told Jack, he said, Jack, you're the greatest world champion that I've ever seen in my life. And your brother hugged Carol Hall. Uh, that, and if, they, if, if the convention people hadn't have came and got Jack and told him, hey, you got to go to work, they'd still be there talking. And Where'd you go, George? And my table was across it. Like, I should have stayed. I should have stayed, but I just wanted to, Jack. Thank you. For I, thank you for sharing that story. Jerry, I'm telling you, Jack could have brushed him off. Jack could have, and he would have had a reason to say, hey, we're busy. We're getting ready to open the doors. Can you come back later? But Jack forgot. He didn't even think about the convention. He spent time with a lifelong fan. And Carol Hall's still with us. I mean, we talk, and and he he's never, that was 2005, and he's never forgot that moment. And I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, Thank you very but, much. Made, John, made a lot. John, look at this. Y'all gonna think I'm crazy. When I was 18, guess what I did? I was a Mark, but I was trying to get into business. I wrote. It was Mark, Mark the Fender. But I, I was Mark, Mark yes. <laughs> I was the biggest Mark, Mark Thunder, okay? But John, look at this. I wrote, if you can believe this, I hand wrote a note to the Briscoe Brothers Body Shop. Can you believe it? I cut grass for a week to get a stamp, Jerry Briscoe. Now, wow. listen to this. And I hope y'all can see this. And I'm wow. going to try to hold it up. But Jack, uh, Jerry, you and Jack both autographed this and mail this back. John, I hope y'all can wow. see this yep. and the listeners can see it. But, yeah. but this... I was 18. I'm 61 now. I, I know. I know that the original because that logo on there was our very first logo. Wow. Our and, very and first what, logo. And what I love about it is y'all took time, Jerry. This is hanging on my wall at my house, and I brought it out of my museum. But I wanted to show you 
that y'all took time. See, y'all took time to, to mail that to me. And as an 18 year old getting in the wrestling business, man, now, now I don't even know where my car keys is, but I know where this eight by 10 is. Okay. Thank you, George. So Thank you. I just wanted to share that is, is, is what a special that you took time uh, that, that your people didn't stamp a picture and send it to me, but that you took time and, and Jack took time. And I, I would not give, believe me, I've had offers for this. I'll sell them the frame, but they're not getting the picture. Well, okay. they, they, you can't get Jack's signature, obviously. No, no, you can't. And, and, and like you said, so like yeah, the, you, you, you mentioned your museum, George. Tell us a little bit what, what's in your museum and, and tell us a little bit about it. And Well, you, you know, uh, uh, nobody nowadays, everything's worth a lot of money, I know. And, and you know, people, uh, uh, you know, get a piece, a piece of memorabilia and they'll try to sell it on eBay or something. But I've never done that. I remember uh, uh, early on, uh, I knew how much pro wrestling meant to me, and I wanted a uh, to start a museum in my home of just some of the stuff that the boys gave me. Not stuff you could buy, but stuff that the boys could give me, uh, could give, I could get. And I'm going to tell you, I asked Wahoo McDaniels one time, Jerry, I said, people ask me all the time, what is your holy grail? In your museum that takes up your whole house, what is your holy grail? I went up to Wahoo one time, and I said, Wahoo, uh, can I have that wrist tape? after your match, because I was going to put it in a, a box and put it in my museum from to have Chief Wahoo's wrist tape. He said, well, if you just hold on, I'll give it to you. So he went and worked a match. Now, Jerry, he came back and he had his feathers, his headdress in this hand. And I was looking at this hand where the tape were. So Wahoo approaches me and he pitches the headdress to me. Can you imagine that, John? Oh, man, I, I, I used to ask Wahoo for a headdress. Oh, Jerry, <laughs> I, and I literally called it and dropped everything that I had in my hand. I mean, I just, and I thought he made a mistake. I thought he, you know, was going to throw the tape. And and so I just stood there like, a, like an idiot, you know, like, is he going to ask for them back? And he said, kid, you better go put those in the trunk. And I swear I took right out. <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah, Man, I was, you know, hiding under my jacket. And so I have Wahoo's headdress wow. Uh, wow. In, in, my, in my museum. And, and it's, what, what, what color is it? Uh, it it's the red. It's, it, it's so beautiful. I wish I'd have brought a picture. It's a red. It's, of course, of course, the feathers are red, but the top of it's yellow. The whole top of the feathers are yellow. And I've got it in a sealed, uh, like Michael Jackson used to sleep in, you know, the sealed the vault. Vault. Man, I've got it in that, and and uh, so that, and I've got. Uh, if you can believe this, I've got. I brought this too. I brought a couple things real quick. Where do you and Michael Jackson buy these things? Man, let me tell you something. <laughs> that, I Is that like on YouTube. Amazon? Like, <laughs> yeah, you should go to Amazon. <laughs> but look at this, Jerry. Now I know everybody has seen this patch, John, and everybody knows this patch. But what's special? These are the original. NWA patches. Now everybody says you can get them made now, but these are the patches that the referees, Sonny Fargo, Jerry, they used to wear on their their referee shirts. And so uh, I don't know, Jerry, if you remember um, Wally Dusick. I old, remember Wally, yeah, very well, yeah. And you know he built all the he wrestled in the fifties. The, the famous Dusick brothers, John. Yes, uh, the Dusick well, Rights one. Yeah. Yes, that's very good. Yeah. And see, Wally built the rings. For Jim Crockett, yeah, uh, even up, yeah. and and so I just happened to go to the same church as Wally and his sweet wife Joyce, and so I knew Wally, but of course he had retired. But I knew he was always sitting at ringside in a nice coat, ringing the bell for Jim Crockett. But Jerry, what I didn't know is he also all those towns for Crockett. He took the ring, he worked the door, he settled up with the coaches and the athletic directors and listen to this y'all. So I become friends with him. So I start making the towns with Wally at the end of the night. He sell he settles up with the athletic director. Listen to this, Jerry, they give him $10,000 in cash. Jim Crockett's percentage from some high school in South Carolina. Wally's holding $10,000 and he puts it in a Brown paper bag. He puts it in a brown sandwich bag. 
and it just wraps it up. And so on the way home in that ring truck, John, I'm dying. I'm thinking, I got to ask this guy, like, why in the heck did he just put 10 grand in a, in a paper sack and not in a, a briefcase? So we get back to Charlotte and he, he, you know, he parks the ring truck and I said, Wally, and he was much older in age then and, and grouchy. And I said, Wally, I got to ask you. I said, why in the heck did you put 10 grand in a paper sack? And, and, and Jerry, listen, he told me something I've never forgot. And I use it to this day. He said, George, if we're going to get robbed, they're not going to steal my sandwich. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought that's like the greatest thing yeah. in the world. So, <laughs> so if I get a payoff now, I just stick it in a paper sack. Yeah. What's the chance <laughs> somebody's going to steal that? So, but you hear of, and I know wrestling's got so big that you got to have hundreds of people, you know, working behind the scenes. But, but all those times that Crockett sent one man yeah. to these towns and that, and that was Wally. So, so I become friends with Wally and um, he just gave me these one day. They were in his toolbox and we go in his little shed where he makes rings and ring posts. And uh, he, he throwed these at me. And so I've had, if you knew the money. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. You remember those blue rain jackets at Crockett's? Uh, yeah. I, 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 I was standing next to Sandy Scott. I come up to make a shot in Greensboro or something like that. Sandy standing there with a jacket on. I said, Sandy, I put a lot of time in this territory. I sure would like to have one of those jackets. Sandy took oh. it off. I can still got it hanging in my closet. Do you? Oh, it's, got, it's got that Mid-Atlantic patch on it. Yes, it does. It's yeah. just, John, it's just an old bl a blue windbreaker. Yeah. It's just an old blue, uh, like you'd wear to stay out of the, the, the rain. Those old, old satin jackets, old satin-like jackets. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, that's so great, Jerry. And believe it, when Wally passed, his family gave me a box of stuff, and you're not going to believe it, one of those blue jackets was was in that. And you know what's special about those jackets? The boys didn't get them like nowadays. No, no, just the employees. <laughs> it was just the employees yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that got them. So, and, and I tell you, my second holy grail, I'd eat. Wally used to love dessert, John. He loved, he loved pudding. He loved cake. I was eating cake at his house one day. <laughs> and I got ready to leave. And, and he had just showed me all of these clippings of his career from the 50s where he had worked Gorgeous George and Luthez and and, and it was all in a shoebox, Jerry, all wrinkled. And I remember I said, Wally, we got, we got to get this stuff out and put it in scrapbooks. And I remember he looked at me and he said, man, you can't go to the drugstore and get a bowl of soup with this stuff. He, he always kept stuff in perspective. <laughs> yeah. but, but I got ready to leave and I said, Wally. Now, that was then. Now, now you can buy more than a bowl of soup. You can buy you a sure good, good Wait, wait a minute. What, what drugstore sold a bowl of soup? Oh, back in the day. Oh, oh, oh in, the, in the South, John, yeah, I'm not sure you had them in Texas too. Craft stores, uh, Woolworths, uh, yeah, all, 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 yeah, all we those. We didn't uh, have, we didn't have soup. All, yeah. all, all, yeah. all, all, all those five. And... Well, you had yeah. beer, you had beer and whiskey. Or Texas. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we did. We're in Texas. <laughs> yeah, but John, they'd have a counter like a little yeah. restaurant. A hot dog, a hot dog counter, basically, right, George? Yeah, sure would. And you could walk up and actually sit for a while, and you could get John. John, some of the most important civil rights still in, in in the country happened at 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 a department store uh, hot dog stand. Oh, that it was should. a that wasn't a diner that the, the 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 guys were at. That was a like a department. That was like a drugstore or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, well, I didn't well, know well, that. Well, I thought it was yeah. like a yeah. diner that they went, no. went to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've seen that. I was just in uh, Memphis at the Civil Rights Museum yeah. and uh, yeah. saw yeah. that photo. Yeah, yeah, and you could, I mean, you could go in and buy anything, but you could get a sandwich or soup. But a lot of, but a lot of the old timers, Wally used to love soup, and he, so he would always use that in an illustration. He'd say, "This these newspaper clippings can't." Buy a bowl of soup, but but I I told Wally that that one night, Jerry, I said, Wally, I love you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. And he said, Well, hold on a minute. And so he couldn't even hardly stand, you know, his body had about to give up. But he called his wife Joyce and whispered in her ear. And Jerry, listen to this. She went back in the room and she came back. And John, you may not remember this. She brought me four original bobby pins. From gorgeous George, oh, Georgie, yeah. Georgie pants, Georgie, Georgie pins. pants. <laughs> yeah. He would go to the ring, John, and he would throw wow. these gold bobby pins yeah. to you the got crowd. Four original, you got four original, huh? Yes. So these are wow. four that came straight from 
uh, they were good friends and him and Wally had worked a bunch. So he'd give Wally a handful of them over the years. So, so I have those in my museum with a good, you know, a beautiful picture of gorgeous George. And, and, you know, the young fans look at this and say, Oh, so what? Uh, no, the young fans are looking at it, man. I'd, I'd give a thousand dollars for that. <laughs> oh yeah. They're big. They're big in the memorabilia now. <laughs> well, you know, my daughter tells me, John, dad, I love you. But as soon as you're gone, we're going to have the biggest yard sale you've ever seen. <laughs> so I said, oh, my goodness. So that, and I tell you, I'm going to update one more thing. This was so goofy and so cool, John, that, that we did a huge show for Bobby Eaton before he passed, one of my favorite people. And, and I got me one of these, John, just because it was so goofy. This is Bobby Eaton's Alabama Jam Jam. Wow. You know, and I... I saw That's it. Right. I, I thought I can't believe somebody's actually like, and I heard it was good. I just hadn't opened it, but I thought, no, don't ever open it. Never. And I thought, man, and of course, the, you know, the proceeds went to help Bobby, and it was just uh, so neat and so goofy that I thought I, I need Alabama Jam, Bobby Eaton's Jam, in my museum. So, uh, so just an amazing, amazing career. You know, we just finished. Uh, John, I'm so sorry. You asked me about my little patch. You know, for the last, the last probably 13 years in Winston-Salem, uh, years ago, me and a good friend, Tracy Myers and Brian Hawks, we got together and we said, let's just do a wrestling convention. Uh, it was really their ideal, uh, just something for the fans. And so they got me involved and, and, and we took a chance many, many years ago and uh, did it. Uh, it's, it's Thanksgiving weekend. It's three days. Uh, fan fest. You can meet the fans, and you hear about it all the time now. But uh, but Wrestlecade to see it grow, Jerry, from day one to we just finished up this past Thanksgiving, and over eight thousand people in four days came through Winston Salem, and they got to meet you know all of their stars, and we did wrestling, and and to be a part of that and to see it grow. And, and it's just for the fans. Uh, we, um, uh, uh, one of our big, big sponsors that we love helping is Toys for Tots. And, and to me, pro wrestling is still the greatest thing, Jerry, that's ever happened in my life. And I know we hear of, of horror stories. We hear of bad things. And I've seen my share of it. But pro wrestling is still, uh, it, it's a perfect example, John, my preacher. My, he's, a, he's a great guy. He tells me, he said, George, if I want to go visit somebody, they won't let me in. He said, they'll lock the door. But if I tell them that I'm bringing a pro wrestler, <laughs> he said, the front door is open. He said, man, there's pie, there's milk on the table because they heard that a pro wrestler is coming. So ain't that neat how pro wrestling is still like the universal language to me. And there's still so much good because, uh, Jerry, you know, Jim Crockett, I tell people he made his money doing fundraisers for the high schools. And uh, I just talked to an old coach in South Carolina in Chester that's retired, but he can still tell you that Jim Crockett promotions helped his football team buy jerseys for his team. George, I, I, was, I, was, a part, I was a part of so much of that in my, in my time there in Carolina because of you know, I, my, my first time, and it was all Mr. Crockett, the senior, Mr. Crockett, right. the senior. And, and I worked so many high schools, did so many fundraisers. And I to this day, I, I'll still have a coach come up to me just out of the blue. I'm from Wade Bro, North Carolina. You did a fundraiser for me. We were able to they take a senior trip off of all that money. That's exactly right. But that so was Jim Crockett, special, senior. Yeah. Yes, that's right. What, what a special, special time. You know, I... Uh, I told Ricky Steamboat this the other day, and 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 matter of fact, Jerry, I have not forgive you and your brother for turning on Jack. I mean, I'm turning on Steamboat and Youngblood. Okay, oh, young, young I, I had it coming. Either. That still <laughs> damaged me as a I'm young man. I'm still mad about it too, George. <laughs> Thank you, John. Listen, the post office would only put the flag up half. Way when that happened, okay? It's terrible what the Briscoe uh, brothers did. Oh, man. It's all. And, and Jerry, you know what was so special and made me so mad is that <laughs> when you and Jack would do a promo, you would never admit to doing anything wrong. Well, we did. Not, we did. See? 
And yeah. then we, 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 we never broke a rule. We bent them all. That's that, what we that, used to say. We, we, we know the rules. We know the rules. We know the oh, rules. Oh, man. But, but that rules. angle with Steamboat and Youngblood and, and you, you but and that, George, that's what made that program so legit that, you know, we didn't break rules. We just were bad at cocky. I know, I, I, know <laughs> I hated both of you, okay? I mean, it was like. Uh, Greg, Greg, Greg Helm to this day, he'd say, well, he, he said, I could never forgive you. No, <laughs> the no. hurricane. <laughs> I mean, we had people naming their kids Youngblood and Steamboat, right? Young, I mean, Youngboat, like, Youngboat, yeah. That, 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 <laughs> they were like the biggest thing ever then for y'all to come along and just, oh my God, what a special, special time. Uh, what a fun know. time that was, too, man. And, and you know what was so special is I remember you would, you would come out with Jack and, and most of the time, you wouldn't really say a lot. You'd just give us that grin, like you got one over on us. And as a fan, still, uh, I wanted to break that TV, you know. <laughs> uh, and then to go see that match live and to see, and it's a testament. I don't even know if guys could do it now, but to get to be loved, especially Jack here in the Carolinas. I remember Jack wrestled Wahoo for an hour uh, in Greensboro. And I remember going, and Jack had as many fans as Wahoo did. It's like you, you're torn, and and so for you and Jack to, oh my goodness, what just happened? I mean, the Long <laughs> Ranger just got shot or turned <laughs> heel. So, but but I said all that. To say Tonto, that. Tonto finally got the right shot in. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, Tonto finally got revenge. <laughs> yeah, Tonto got revenge. That's right. Yeah. But just to live with those those memories, yeah. uh, I, I never want to. I never want to let them go. I mean, it was just such a special, uh, special time, you know, in my life. And that's what I try to recapture. You know, when I opened uh, years ago, John opened up a wrestling school, and and it wasn't that I wanted to. I know everything. But you know what I miss in my day, and I know y'all experienced this. When I screwed up, I remember Ole Anderson used to cuss me. Every time I'd get out of the ring, he'd cuss me for something. That was looked stupid. That looked this. And finally one day in Atlanta, I said, Ole, I'm tired of it. I said, you got to quit cussing me. I said, I know I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. And Ole looked at me, and he said, son, he said, when I quit cussing is when you need to worry. And it hit me that when – he quit cussing. That meant he quit watching. And so that made sense. And in his weird way, at least he was watching me, John. And he was, in his weird way, if he quit cussing, it meant he quit caring. Now, I ain't saying I like to get cussed out, but it made me look at it a little bit different is they corrected you on the spot. Like when you screwed up in a ring with uh, Ron Starr or, or Scott Irwin or Bill Irwin, they fixed it right then. They didn't wait till you got in the back and said, oh, man, we're sorry about this. You should have ducked that elbow. Uh, boy, they fixed it. And I, I love that. So when I opened my school, uh, I just wanted to pass on a little bit of, of what I was taught. Not that I know everything, John, but I, uh, I, I know right from wrong because I've been told right from wrong. And I have a picture hanging at home in my museum, and I got very lucky is one night at training, I had Ricky Steamboat's son, Ric Flair's son, Bobby Eaton's son, and Tully Blanchard's daughter, all the same night training. And you talking about such an honor to me. Uh, you know, when, when Ric Flair brings his son and says, here, I need you to train my son, you, you better know what, you know, you better know a little bit of what you're doing. And so what a, a privilege it's been uh, for me to... Uh, uh, train some of these uh, the older guys' sons, and and you know it's hard on the sons, uh, John. You know, Jerry. You know that wrestling fans think just because your dad was famous that you're just going to get it. Yeah. That's one thing I want to bring up, and, and, and it's really, really cool. You got a special relationship with with Rick Flair. Rick, Rick, you're one of Rick's favorite people. And Rick's told me that many, many times. And Thank that, you. And that's cool. Thank you, Jerry. You know. Back in the day, Rick didn't know who I was, but the thing about Rick Flair, John, is he he was the NWA world champ. He wore the nice suits uh, early in the morning, as we talked about on the tapings, and he hated to wrestle TV because he had a plane to catch. So he hated to get sweaty and have to jump on a plane and, you know, just sweaty. And so he, he, he loved to do the promo and then leave and go catch on a plane. Well, one day, Dusty Rhodes, who was the boss, he told Rick Flair, well, you're going to work a match. And Flair was ready to get in a taxi. He was ready to go catch a plane. He's flying to Puerto Rico. But Dusty, the boss, is going to make him wrestle. 
and thank the Lord for some reason, Rick says, well, give me George South. And see then we didn't, we didn't dress with the guys. We were in a little broom closet. Right. So I didn't know who was you were You weren't at Ted Turner's office. No, I was not <laughs> in Ted Turner's office like the Briscoes were. Another reason the Briscoes were hated. <laughs> Still hated to this day. That's right. But Flair I got to put up with this every week, George. Oh, bless your heart. Did John Thank Young, you. Oh, was you there Black Friday or Black Saturday, Green Saturday or whatever? Yeah, yeah, was. yeah, yeah, yeah. They call it Black. Yes, yes, sir. And, it was and, Green Saturday if you were. Uh, I, I call it oh, Green Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> it, was black. It, was black. it was black for everybody tell, else. Tell, tell us a little bit about that day there, but, George. Well, well, for me, uh, early on, Flair just said, give me George. And so we go out there and – I, to this day, uh, it, I'm more, I mean, it was probably my all-time favorite matches. Flair took me out there, and for 20 minutes on TV, uh, he just let me bump him like crazy. And, I mean, I thought I was going to win the NWA World Belt. <laughs> I mean, it was the most nerve-wracking moment. We didn't talk over anything. I, I, You know, I saw Rick when he played his music, and he walks through the curtain with J.J. And so that match, 30-something years ago, fans still talk about it to this day because they actually thought that I was going to win. I mean, Flair went out there and he made it a match and he didn't have to do that. So I tell you, he was, I, he was, he was pissed off. And they wanted to he was pissed. Yeah. He was ticked <laughs> off at dusty. He said, I'll get you back. He you wanted know? to say, he wanted to show Mr. Dream. But, but Jerry, I'm That's you, right. yeah. <laughs> uh, they went to a commercial and I'm so blowed up. We've done been 12 <laughs> minutes. So I'm thinking, good. We'll go to a commercial and Flair will grab a hold. Well, when they went to a commercial, he didn't grab a hold. <laughs> he just kept going. And and so when the match was over, they, they the referee, uh, uh, I mean, he had to put his hands on me and roll, <laughs> you know, like an old roll of biscuit, you know, dough. He had yeah. to literally roll me out of the ring. I was so blowed up and, and to this day. But I thank Flair every time I see him because I, I don't want to say that match probably made me, but it – I'm going to tell you, after that moment, it's like every top guy would ask, can I work with George South? And it goes back to what I said earlier, John, because I, I knew my job, even then, was to go out there with Ric Flair, and, and he didn't need my help, but I was going to make, I was going to make him look like a hundred million bucks. Because the way our business worked, Gary, as you knew, if people paid to see Rick, I'm going to be in the first and second match, and then I'm going to see from that. And and that's what was so special. You, I could run it in the ground, but we all depended on each other, Jerry. We did. We did. It was, was a team. Like you said at the very beginning of the conversation, it was a team effort back back in those days. We worked as a team. We we, we traveled as a team. And and, 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 and when you were in dressing room, there were you know, there were you know you had the personal conflicts, but. Right. Overall, everybody knew what they had to get along. To so wait a minute, George, George, tell me about when it wasn't a team and the Briscoes sold the territory out from under. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm not driving to Atlanta no more either, John. Okay. <laughs> Dad burn you, Briscoes. And there goes one of the five houses you bought, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I had to go that's, get a that's why he's mad at you. Yeah, that's why you're mad. He had nothing to do with Steamboat Youngblood. <laughs> yeah, I had to go get a real job, John. Can you believe that? Dang it. Uh, but so you tell know, us about back. that. Tell us about that Saturday morning. Well, you know what was so special? And I look back is, for me, it's almost like what Dusty said earlier, that I was so unimportant that my name was not on either list. Well, even when Black Sunday or whatever it was they called it, they still needed guys for TV, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I was so unimportant, John, and so under the radar that I just kept a job. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. Because <laughs> so they still needed guys to, you know, go out there and work on television. Uh, so, so I, yeah, I knew what was what was happening. But, you know, I'm going to say this, and, and people tell me that, that it's not important, but here, nobody ever talks about this. All I ever hear, and I... You know, 41 years. This Christmas, I'll be in wrestling 42 years, guys. And I've loved every moment. And to this day, I hear how Vince McMahon killed wrestling. And I get wow. so tired. If he killed it, I wish he'd do it again. Oh, no my kidding. God. No kidding. But listen, think about this. And here's my answer to that. And I've said it on many podcasts. Do you realize that all Vince done was offered 
a contract or he offered a deal to all of those promoters, Jerry. I mean, I'm talking Memphis, everywhere. And do you realize from Portland to, to St. Louis, everybody, all he done was offer it. And guess what? They all took it. <laughs> do you know that? What if they all would have said no, Jerry? What if they'd all said no? Yeah. Would he have went back and the territories continued? Uh, who knows? But it's no well, it's, yeah, George, you know why they took it? Because they saw what was coming, man. They saw that big sure train, train rolling from the east, man. They knew they, they couldn't sure compete. Did. And, and, so they, they and get, you know, George, so I want to. I'm sorry, Jerry. No, go get, ahead. Get get something out of it instead of right, nothing. Right. Exactly. And George, I want to tell you, they people talk about the difference between professional wrestling or sports entertainment. Yeah. I was in professional wrestling. It didn't pay any money. Yeah. No, no, it didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> if Vince McMahon ruined wrestling, <laughs> thank you. Thank Amen. You. <laughs> Amen. Jerry, listen to this. You know, I used to grow my hair out like Ted Nugent. I mean, it when I, I ain't got much left, but but John, I would grow it out to it would be way out to here like Ted Nugent. And the boys used to rib me like, man, you got to do something about that hair. You got to do something about that hair. But listen, I knew that I was going to WWF at the end of the month. Now, listen to this. I was so smart. People think I'm a dummy. <laughs> Brutus Beefcake had just come on the scene. And his gimmick was after he beat you with a sleeper, he would cut your hair on television. Well, Chief J. Strongbow would come into the dressing room and he would look around and guess who had the wildest looking hair you ever seen was me, right? So I would go out on television with this hair flying everywhere. And Brutus, he, you know, he would come up in the dressing room. He'd say, where do you want me to cut? You know, and I'd say, I don't care. Just wherever, right? So listen to this, guys. No, I, people think I'm crazy. So WWE <laughs> paid me 300, WWF paid me 300 for the match. I got an extra 350 for letting them cut my hair, John. And then as soon as I got out of the ring, I went and sat down with their full-time beautician who fixed my hair <laughs> for free. <laughs> free haircut and wash out of the deal, Jerry. So and it didn't even look like your hair had been cut. <laughs> didn't even look like it. So eight weeks in a row. I did wow. that. I bought another house from just getting my hair cut. So I'm you gonna... for, so you forgive me then. I'll forgive you. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> now I know why everybody went to WWF. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'll never forget Strom uh, about that ninth week, Jay Strombo come in there and he said, George, he said, I'm sorry. He said, We can't cut your hair this time. <laughs> he said, people are going to catch on. But that's we had never, the boys had never got paid extra for anything in the other companies. And you know this, Jerry, they would have cut my hair. Heck, they did it. <laughs> it hit the street. <laughs> it was just a part of the business. Yeah. So I knew then why, why everybody was leaving. Listen, the first catering, it sounds so <laughs> silly. It sounds so silly now. The first catering that I had ever experienced was for WWF. Jerry, the boys where I came, the boys, the Carolina, no way, you didn't get, there was no food. You got, no. you grabbed a hot dog on the way in or something. <laughs> yeah. So those little things, listen, I'm, I'm just simple. When, when WWF brought ice cream bars, John, <laughs> listen to the dressing room and for the boys to eat, I was, I was, I was putting them in my pockets. <laughs> Nobody had ever done. Do you have any of those in your Brazil? Oh, I've got the, I've got the, they came with a little sticker. The I've stick that it had, had, a, had a character on there. Yes, no. it sure did. Yeah. So I knew even then why everybody that was anybody wanted to go to WWF because it was, I, I'm telling you, Jerry, John, it was not, uh, I was not in Kansas no more. I was, Dorothy <laughs> had just seen The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. And, and so that's why I continued to go back every chance I could. Uh, you know, first time Jake Roberts, he said, you, are you afraid of snakes? I said, well, I don't know. I've never been like real close to one. He said, well, you're fixing to find out. So he DDTs me and I didn't know that he was going to leave Damien in the sack. So I'm laying there like I'm knocked out, Jerry, and waiting on this, you know, I'm waiting on this uh, snake. Well, he throws the whole sack on me and I come right up. I set up just like the undertaker. I mean, I killed the whole DDT. <laughs> I said, like, get me out of here. But man, 
And you know when I knew wrestling was different, I walked in the dressing room and I looked over and here's Coco Beware. He had the bird. I looked over. Steamboat had that big dragon. Remember, he used to be that big Kamala dragon. And then Bad News uh, Brown, Bad News Allen, he had that big sewer rat. Remember, they were doing angle where he took this yeah. big sewer rat to the ring and, and the British Bulldogs. There were a lot of rats dogs. around back then. <laughs> Man, a lot of rats. <laughs> but there was like 12 animals in the business. And I'm oh, thinking, yeah, yeah. Man, things have changed, okay? <laughs> Bobby well, Heenan in his Hall of Fame speech, I'm sure you were there, Jerry, probably around 96 or something. Yeah, yeah. He lists all the animals at one time off the top of his head. People gave him a standing ovation. It was, <laughs> one, of the, it was one of the greatest speeches I've ever it heard. Sure was. Bobby, Bobby's sure voice was. had already started to fall, falter yeah. on him. So you yeah. just you had to really strain to listen, but it was it showed you how great Bobby Heenan was. But when he got to all the animals, that's when everybody went crazy. Uh John, I'm glad you mentioned Bobby. Do you know there was a, a convention called WrestleCon that's still very, very popular? Well, early on they did a huge event in Florida. And I took my ring. It was a two-day event, missing link, all the guys were there. And that afternoon I'm setting the ring up and I'm I'm pulling ropes the ring ropes off the trailer and i feel somebody behind me picking up the ropes to carry them and i turn around and believe it or not it was bobby heenan he saw me if you can believe this i wish i'd have had a camera he saw me pulling the ring ropes in and he carried half that ring in with me and people didn't bother him because they didn't think it was like the bobby heenan they thought it was just one of my students that looked like Bobby Heenan. But to this day, I tell everybody, he did not have, he, he was famous. I mean, he was there to be one of the guests, but he saw a guy bringing a ring in and he helped. And and I'm telling you stories like that, I can't make them up and they will they will stick with me forever to for him to do that. And I mean, he, he, he helped me set up my ring. And fans could have came up to him, but they didn't. It was so funny because everybody was avoiding him because they just thought this was just some, you know, little independent wrestler guy that's just helping with the ring. But Bobby the Brain Heenan helped me set that ring up. Man, what a special man. Oh, and one more thing, Jerry, real quick. I don't know how much time we got. i got to show you this. This right here, John, JBL, look at this. Now, Jerry, this is 1950. Wally Dusick's wrestling trunks. Wow, 1950 trunks. Wow. 1950, and I wish y'all could feel it, John. It feels just like an old potato sack. <laughs> I mean, it's that old, uh, how they work. Bur bur burlap stuff. Huh? Yeah, it's just that old burlap sack with, with, with a sack with a with a rope through it. But can you imagine? And, and you can see the sweat stain, what makes it so great. Oh, you can see the sweat stain. And, and you there. know why his wife gave them to me? And it's so special. She said, George, I had to get him out of the house. She said, because Wally at 80 years old would go to TV and some young kid would talk about wrestling being fake. And Wally would try to bring those trunks with him. I've seen that. I've seen Have that you? happen. Yeah, I saw that happen oh. that many times. Uh. <laughs> so his wife said, I had to get him out of the house because Wally would go looking for him to take him to TV. He was going to put him on <laughs> and get in the ring and stretch some young guy that said wrestling was fake. So uh, that's, that's so, a fact, man. That's a fact. So you, 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 uh, uh, George, we would love maybe do a part two of this thing from your museum one day. I would love that. I'd love yeah. that. I stole Steamboat sign. You know, he had a gym. You remember his middle yeah. gym in yeah. the Carolinas? Yeah, right, yeah. When he sold it, John, I went one time late at night and I stole his sign. <laughs> I mean, it, this thing is as big as a wall and I've got it mounted in my living room. Wow. And, and I told Steamboat, I said, I got to tell you something, but you promise you can't take it back. He had no clue. He thought it was just sold with the building. Huh. So I, I showed him a picture. I said, I stole your sign. He was more impressed that I didn't get put in jail. <laughs> that I actually got the sign. Well, I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you how you did it because the listener of this, you know, we sold Briscoe Brothers Body Shop. We, we had one of those big plastic signs at Briscoe Brothers Body Shop. And so the realtor came by my house yesterday, had me sign some, some sign-off papers. And he said, I just sold, sold, your, sold your shop. And I said, I said, do you still have that sign? He said, yeah, the guy put 
and I, uh, I've got to figure out a way I'm going to get wow. down and steal that damn thing. Oh, so, please do. You know, I had a, I had a, I tell you how you do it. You call George. Man, <laughs> call George or George. Like, George. <laughs> Just let me know. Give me that okay? sign. Okay? Man, I had a flatbed screw, uh, screwdriver and I stood on <laughs> top of an old white van in the middle of the night. <laughs> and, and, and my hands are still calloused and bleeding from, but I got it down with an old flathead screwdriver. Wow. And I take, and I literally duct taped it to the top of my van to get out of shop. <laughs> so, but it's hanging, it's hanging yeah. in my living room, yeah. Steamboat Gym yeah. sign. Yeah, I want to ask you one before we go here, because it's been such a great time, George, and you've been so genuine, genuine with your time there. But uh, yeah, a guy very near, dear to you and me, uh, one, when I died recently at 95 years old, you know who I'm talking about, the great uh, New Zealander, Abe Jacob there. Oh, my a, tell us tell us a great story about Abe. You, you know what was so special about Abe is to the day, there was a little gym, a little weightlifting gym here in the Carolinas years ago, and Abe worked at the front desk, Jerry, and he was like the greatest employee. And what I mean by that is I've never seen anybody and his career was that way. Everything, his career was that way. His greatest every, everything he did, he did first class. Yeah. And I remember I would go to this little gym. It was a little small family gym, and Abe worked the counter. And I'd always love to go at closing time because nobody would be there. It would just be me and him. And he would literally take two hours to close this, this little gym down. I mean, he, he wiped down the equipment. He, you know, whereas I say, Abe, just sweep that up under the rug and let's go. And he said, no, 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 I got to do my job and his career. But here's the thing about Abe Jacobs. For years, you would hear the fans say, oh, here's Abe. He didn't save his money. He was just a loser. He worked first or second match. Do you know that finally, Jerry, and you may have knew this, but he shared with me, he showed me some pictures one night of a waterfall. It looked like Niagara Falls. And I said, man, Abe, is that where you have traveled? He said, no, that's mine. I said, excuse me. He said, that whole property over in New Zealand that included uh, waterfalls and wild animals, he owned that all these years. So he that just meant something so much to me that he he got the last laugh, if that makes sense. Oh, well, hey, hey, Abe was not a spend trips at all. Abe was a very frugal guy, man. To this day, before he passed, he, I remember I had a ring. He let me set a ring up one time in, in, in that gym and just to train some young guys. And I remember I got there late one day for training and, and I noticed the canvas was wet. And I looked over there and, and, and Abe was sweating. I mean, Abe, he, Abe, Abe was a sweater too. Oh, <laughs> and, and I'm going to tell you, and, 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 and as I was, I just got there and a guy walked out, he was limping. This big old guy, looked like a football player. He was limping and walking past. Didn't say hey to me or nothing. Walked right out, and he was hurt. He was in pain. And so I got in there, and I looked at the ring. The canvas is wet. Abe's sweating. And I knew right then that Abe had just got this smart aleck kid, this big old you know guy in the ring, and stretched him. And I just laughed. I never said a word about it. But Abe was, was first class. I, do you know this, a little trivia? When Ric Flair came to Charlotte, Abe Jacobs was his very first match ever wow. in Charlotte. Can you believe that? I didn't know that for years, yeah. but a uh, great guy. Great guy. Well, hey, George, thank you so much for your time. I've been looking forward to this for a while, and this was uh, so entertaining and so much fun. It's a pleasure to get to see you and thank talk you. to you and meet you for, I guess, officially our first time. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, both of you, man. I hope I, I think y'all introduced me, and I talked for three hours, I think. That's but, okay. Uh, the show's okay. about you. But just so many great memories. If we introduced you and we talked, that wouldn't really accomplish much. <laughs> well, when I leave here, I'll go by the old Park Center. Uh, Jerry, it's still there. I'm uh, you know, one day I'm going to buy it, I think. And, and oh, just, good. Uh, good. You know, those you, know, you know, it's a sad time there. Hey, uh, uh, good old Luther Lindsay passed out in that and he, he died. He sure did. I've heard that. Yes, sir. Wow. And, you know, if, so if I buy you a cup of coffee, Jerry, you got to be there when I get back. That's right. Well, well, when, when, you, when you when you buy the when you die, buy the damn place, I'll come and celebrate with you. Oh, oh, yeah. We'll do the great. And I, how about I'll put you over? Yeah. Oh, well, thank thank both of you so so much. It was thank my, you, George. My pleasure, it's been man. special. God, oh, God bless both of you.